But let's recap our key verse. Bring this up on the screen. I'd like you to read this out at all locations. Come on, lift up your voice. Let's read Jeremiah 29, 13. Come on. You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. Now you'll notice in that verse, there's a call and response. God says, you seek, you'll find. You call, I'll answer. You humble yourself, you'll be exalted. You give, it will be given. These are conditional promises of the word of God that any of us can step into. Here's another one in Jeremiah 33, 3, which I love. If you haven't committed this to memory, it's a great verse to memorize. Uh, and it says this, God says, call to me, I'll answer you, and I'll tell you great and unsearchable things. Or maybe your translation says great and mighty things that you do not know. And so, in fact, let's read this one together. All locations with some passion. Here we go. Call to me and I will answer you and tell you great and unsearchable things you do not know. So what are these great and unsearchable things? Well, there's actually a Hebrew word uh, pronounced batsar, and it means this, the inaccessible mysteries and secrets of God. Inaccessible. In other words, they're above my pay grade. Right? I don't have clearance to tap into these unsearchable things. But when I seek him, there's a call in the spirit like John heard in the book of Revelation. God said, come up here and I will show you. Come up and you'll have revelation. See, we all live at a, a certain spiritual elevation. And if you just entertainment and daily job and daily grind and social media, you're living at a very low spiritual elevation even if you're a Christ follower. But as you seek him, as you shut the door to the secret place, as Pastor Tasha preached last week, as you push back the flesh and fast and cry out to God, you begin to gain spiritual elevation, and with that comes the unsearchable, mighty things of God. The mysteries of God are revealed. It's, it's like the first time you flew in a plane in a storm. Maybe it was raining sideways and crazy, which means you probably took off out of Portland or Seattle. And as you took off, the plane's kind of bumping and shaking. And then the first time you went into those clouds, a little spooky, right? You went from seeing the ground of all of a sudden right outside the window, just dark gray. And it's kind of terrifying. And then, but a couple minutes later, you break through the clouds. And there's Mount Hood glistening in the sun and the blue sky and the white fluffies down below. And you begin to sing, I can see clearly now the rain is gone. Come on, Ispe. I can see all the obstacles. Oh, holding it up strong in this area right over here. Thank you, Ted. What is that? It's elevation. That beauty was there the whole time. The mystery was there the whole time. The answer to that thing, that the conundrum of your life was there the whole time. But God says, you call unto me, cry out and don't stop and you will receive this revelation you need for the future. Now, one of the greatest things that I found that happens as we seek God, which is what we're talking about this month, is we experience a heart change. He actually expands our capacity to love and believe and to feel things and, and to embrace people like never before because our desires um, are realigned. And you've all experienced this where your heart found a brand new capacity. Maybe it was your first pet or your first boyfriend, but every parent in the room gets this. When that first child came into the world, all of a sudden you realize your heart had a capacity to love that you never realized before. And so it is with God. When God gets a hold of your heart, he gives you a capacity to love people that are unlovable, to love nations you've never been to and have a heart after him. And Ezekiel 36 is a promise to God's people. Let, let me read, excuse me, verse 24. Let me get a drink of this tea, see how it's doing. Oh, that's lovely. God says, I will gather you from all the nations and bring you home again to your land. Let me just stop there. As I was reading this earlier, preparing for the weekend, Lord said, this is a prophetic verse. Right now, God is bringing people from a land of captivity. That's what this verse is about. What the Holy Spirit is doing right now is prodigal sons and daughters have been away from the house. People that have backslidden from their faith and been far from God. We are in a season where God is drawing them back home. So keep praying. Maybe that's you today. Maybe you've been at a distance and you felt this drawing, this tug. That's a work of the Holy Spirit. And then God's promise is this. He says, I will give you a new heart. I will put a new spirit in you. I will take out your stony, stubborn heart and give you a tender, responsive heart. That was a work of grace. And he's talking to people who'd become 
calloused and jaded and cynical because they've been in captivity for so long. They didn't think it was possible to be restored to their homeland. And God said, no, I'm going to do a new thing and give you a brand new heart. So here's the progression. God draws you, and then you respond by seeking him, and then he transforms our hearts. Here's a few examples of what happens with this heart exchange that God does. Bitter people become sweet. Angry people become kind. Greedy hearts become generous hearts. Self-centered people become selfless. Unforgiveness turns into forgiveness. Rebellious hearts become obedient. We begin to love what God loves and we begin to hate what God hates. And actually we develop a heart for the nations. And all he wants, listen, is the center of who you are. Here's a verse to get deep in your spirit. Proverbs 23, 26, he says, O son, O daughter, give me your heart. See, some people think God wants their money. He doesn't need your money, he's doing just fine. God wants all my stuff. He don't need your stuff. God wants my time. He's got plenty. He's eternal, right? What God wants is your heart. And when he has your heart, where your treasure is, your heart will be also. So your treasure follows your heart. He'll have your time, your talent, your marriage, your future. So he says, give me the center of who you are. And when we give it to him, he does something so powerful. He gives us a heart like his. We start to love the things that he loves and we care more about those in human trafficking and the innocent unborn babies and those that are being affected by war. And we care about people that have never heard his word at such a level that it will cause us to give sacrificially, to serve, to get on a plane and go minister in a foreign land. And I do want to talk to you today about God's heart for the nations and how he wants to give you a heart that goes far beyond the real estate that you live on. And this comes out of seeking. When God was talking about David in Acts 13, look at this, because David is the prime example. He is the model God pursuer in scripture. Acts 30, 13, 22 says, I found David, son of Jesse, can we read the bold? A man after my own heart. He will do everything I want him to do. Now, how did David get that heart? Well, his life verse is Psalm 27, four. He said, one thing have I desired of the Lord, and that will I seek that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to gaze upon his beauty and to seek him in his temple. David was a one thing person. His highest priority was to pursue God. His greatest joy was to climb Mount Zion and go into the tent where the Ark of the Covenant would rest and play his instrument and simply be in the presence of God. See, you westernized California Christians, I'm guilty as well. We're so busy and frantic and our schedules and all the things we got to accomplish. And quite a few of those are legit, but we pack our lives and our schedules so full of trivia. What would happen if we just eliminated so much of the trivia, the frivolity, the unnecessary entertainment and said, God, I just want to seek your face. You know what happened? When you give him your heart, you accomplish his will. Look what it says of David in Acts 13. This is his, uh, his epitaph a few verses later. For David, after he'd served and accomplished the purpose of God in his own generation, he died. <laughs> in other words, he, he accomplished everything that God had for him once he had the heart that God had given him. And the highest version of your life your ultimate potential is found as a pursuer of God. So he wants to put a heart in you that will cause you to run after him. And then you'll be able to say, I hope one day they'll be able to save me when I burned up all my years. Here's Dave. He accomplished the purpose of God in his generation. You know, when you have a heart after God, there's some things that take place inside of you. Here's three of them right here. Number one, we see with an eternal perspective. Now, because I've been on the planet quite a few decades, um, far more decades than most of you in the room, I am thinking now with an eternal perspective, standing before him on that day. I want to hear him say, well done, good and faithful servant. But from a life of seeking him, I, I believe I'm now, for the most part, living with an eternal perspective. What have I invested? What have I sowed? Who have I invited to come to Jesus? These are the things that truly matter. And the more you seek him, the more you realize that life is short, Eternity is real and, and people matter most. Number two, when we have his heart, we're gonna see people the way God sees them. You know, when your heart is cold and 
calloused and bitter and you've been hurt and wounded and you're not healed from that. You're very cynical and jaded with people, critical, and you're very cautious. But the more that God fills your heart, it's easier to have compassion. And you just realize, man, all God's children got some problems. And people are messed up and they're broken. You know what they need? They need compassion and love and smiles and grace. And, and I want to have the capacity to forgive everybody in my world. You know, I don't just prepare the word to preach to you. I, I actually go to the word so that I can get nourished and grow. And so I, I listen to sermons and podcasts and audio books and, and study the word. And I was listening to a pastor the other day and he really spoke to me. He said this, and I'll share it with you. He said, take inventory of the list of names of people in your world that when their name comes up, there's still a twinge in your heart. Still a uh, little bit of resentment, a little bit, I hope they get theirs, a little bit, I never want to see them again. If there's any of that in my heart, it means I haven't fully forgiven them with the love of Christ. So I begin to go down my list. Oh, yes, I have one. <laughs> and no, you're not on it. Well, maybe that guy. Anyway, I'll move on. Just kidding. So I went down my list and I categorically named people. I said, God, I, I completely forgive them and I love them. I wanna see them back in your house. I pray your blessing. Man, it was a moment. I, I spent, I guess the list was longer than I thought. But I spent a few minutes because God's heart is that there's nobody in your life that you would have animosity, angst, or ill will against. And number three, when we find his heart, we're gonna have a heart for the nations. You know, Jesus when he launched the church, he told his followers, go wait in Jerusalem and, and wait there and the power of the Spirit's gonna come upon you. And then he strategically launched the New Testament church on the day of Pentecost, which was during the feast of Passover, uh, after the feast of Passover. But because of this particular festival, uh, all the, the pilgrims, uh, those Jews that would come to the festivals were all gathered on Mount Zion in Jerusalem from every nation. Look at this in, in Acts 2.5. It says, now they were staying in Jerusalem, God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. And then the Lord, he provided Holy Spirit translation. They all heard him speaking the truth of God and the mysteries of God in their own dialect. Why? Because God doesn't want anyone left out from hearing the gospel and hearing his message of grace. Then there's an invitation in Psalm 2 for us to step into this heart for the nations. It's called a messianic psalm, which means it's primarily for Christ the Messiah. But as you come into him, this verse is for you. Psalm 2.8. Only ask and I will give you the nations as your inheritance, the ends of the earth as your possession. And so we're praying for nations. We're asking for nations. We're asking for Haiti and Romania and India and Sri Lanka and Poland and all the nations you guys travel to from the Father's house. We're asking God for an inheritance of souls in those nations because this is what heaven is gonna look like. Check this out, Revelation 7. And I looked and there before me was a great multitude that no one can count from every nation, tribe, people, and language. And they were standing before the throne and before the Lamb, and they were shouting with a great roar, salvation comes from our God who sits on the throne and from the Lamb. See, God's heart is for every tribe, every ethnic group. This is what heaven is going to be like. And so when we find his heart, we're going to find ourselves praying for, investing in, and traveling beyond the familiar real estate that we stand on and go to work in and live our lives upon. We have a heart for the nation. So in 2024, a little vision for you. God is calling us to have a, a global reach and a global impact like never before. Now we've been going to different countries for 27 years and we've drilled wells in India and built Bible colleges and built churches and done worship schools and crusades. This is your legacy, your heritage at the Father's house. But God is calling us to do more. A couple reasons, time is short. These are the final days. These are the perilous times we live in. And then the second reason is this. Jesus made this statement. He says, to whom much is given, much is required. Now, we started the church with eight people and no money and no building and no clue. We didn't have much to give, but we, we began to invest what we had. And God gave us more, and we invested it. And God gave us more, and we helped plant churches, and he gave us more. And now we are a church that has much. We have a lot of people hanging around all the locations. We have a lot of access and resource and opportunities and finances that flow through this house. 
But it's not so we can just sit back and say, well, we did it. You built a mega church. Good on you. Way to go. You know, let's enjoy the ride. No, no, no. To whom much is given, much is required. And God is stretching us again to travel like never before, to invest in nations like never before. Uh, our media team and uh, our IT guys that are brilliant put this together. I want you to go online. Uh, we're calling this Global Reach. This is now our missions endeavors. And uh, your global impact will start. And here, here's our, our value uh, for the Father's house. We're gonna live for the bigger picture. We're gonna take actually action locally and globally. We're gonna go into all the world. We will and have been fulfilling Matthew 28, 18. Amen. Now, you may not know this, but we have uh, 17 different ministries, healthy ministries, missions ministries that we support financially every month. And there's seven strategic partners. Here's just a few of them right here. I'm gonna show you a brief video from Messenger International. But if you can read this, we support a ministry called Surge. In fact, one of our overseers, Pastor uh, Larry Stockstill from Bethany Church in, in Baton Rouge, uh, they have an amazing global ministry. I don't know if you can read this, but at least seven new churches have been planted every day. 2,820 churches planted in 2023, over 29,000 plus churches planted through search, and you support that. In other words, there are people that will be in heaven because of your generosity. I'm talking to those of you who give, those of you who get it, those of you who invest. And we have another one of our main strategic partners, Messenger International, our good friends, uh, John and Lisa Bevere, and they have a ministry where they translate uh, their books, discipleship resources, the scriptures into hundreds of languages. And they do conferences and seminars and they, they ship these resources and they have a digital platform called Messenger X and they're reaching tens of millions of people with the gospel. Now as a church, we invest in them monthly. And every year, uh, Don and I go to an event in Colorado Springs and we represent all of you. And we make a financial commitment and we invest in this ministry and our board of directors gives me a, a limit, kind of a ceiling, and I always exceed it and then I ask for forgiveness later. <laughs> so far they've forgiven me. But uh, before we wind up the message, I wanna take a couple minutes and, and I want you to see and hear what you're investing in with Messenger International and then a personal thank you from John Bevere. Check this out. In this vast world, more than two billion people lack discipleship resources in their language. But every year, we face this challenge head on, one person at a time. Through partners like you, this work extends to the nations, activating thousands of translators, coordinators, distributors, and printers who use messenger resources to see the Great Commission realized in their communities. Jesus says, <laughs> Work in Asik and Bokchash Haravitar and Karozek, who make him the boss and get Hoskibera. Եվ գիրքը որ դուք ստեղծում եք, էպերը որ դուք անում եք, այն գործը որ դուք անում եք, եւ մարդ եւ որ մենակը կարող է բացի եւ տիրոջը հանդիպի, այնպես որ տերը օրտնի ձես։ Եվ այն հրաշք որ աստված արեց իմ կյանքում Ես հասկացամ մի բան եւ երբ որ սկսեցինք աշխատել Ջոն եւ Լիզա Բիվերների հետ ես այդ սիրտը աստծու տեսա իրանց մեջ որ աստված դուր ինձ այդ սիրտը մեր զավոր արևելքի քարտեզն է որ ես ուշադ իր նայեցի տեսա որ ամբողջ քարտեզը բաղկացած էր տարբեր լեզուների գրքերով մոզայիկային նման քարտեզը հավաքված էր գրքերից տարբեր վերնագրեր տարբեր լեզուներ տարբեր են եւ ես հասկացայեմ ներսում որ Say I'm coach Huma. Meng Arten, that's not what's the root of it. Concrete 
Thank you so much for your faith, for your kindness. I'm so blessed and praise the Lord because of you and your team. To all of you, thank you. Thank you so much. 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 Thank you so Thank you so much. We really appreciate all that you do. Mi gir ke vore pochu mat mi mar tu gyanke arje es gyankere. Hey, Father's House, Lisa and I want to thank you so much for what you've already done. You say, what have we done? You've done a lot because you have wise leaders. Pastor Dave and Pastor Donna have been supporting this outreach to the nations of the world for years. And as a result of what we've all done together, already 64 million discipleship resources have gone out to believers all over the world. 675 million people wouldn't even have a book available, not even a course available, had it not been because of your efforts and us doing this together. So I want to thank you for what you're about to do this year, because Pastor Dave shared with me on the phone, we want to take it to another level. Thank you. Millions of people will come up to you in eternity and say, thank you for giving what I needed to be strengthened in my walk. So I didn't fall away. I didn't burn out. I was discipled because of you. All I can say is a massive thank you. And Lisa and I love you so much. All right. I love what these guys are doing. And, and they, they are, in fact, the real deal. Uh, and so I want to invite you to be a part of it. If you go to that website or scan the QR code, it's real quick to get to this page here. And uh, you can become a, a monthly supporter with us and our IT team and Tim Peterson and some other geniuses, they just put this together. It's really easy. And, and so I, I told him, I said, Tim, I, I want to be the first one. And so it just came online yesterday and leaders go first. So Don and I have already committed to go above our tithe and say, God, every month we're going to sow into global reach. and We're going to make an impact. And I want to ask you. And those of you in this room that you get it, you bring the Lord the first and the best, and you bring your tithe to the Lord to pray and ask the Holy Spirit, God, what would you have me give on a monthly basis? And the amount is not really the issue. That's between you and the Holy Spirit. It might be 50 bucks a month, 100 bucks a month, or you know, 10,000. That's your budget. But that's between you and the Lord. But here's what God put in my spirit. I was praying a, a couple months ago. Uh, actually, I, I prayed since then, but let me just <laughs> clarify that. But a couple months ago, before the end of the year, the Lord spoke to me, and he said, I want you as a church to give an additional $1 million to world missions in 2024. And that's a pretty good number, but that's where we're headed. Amen? Yeah. Now, just so you know, to whom much is given, much is required. I remember that when we first started the church, we didn't have enough money to pay the rent. And I wasn't on staff. I was working a couple side hustle jobs. And we, we couldn't afford people or equipment, and, and uh, we were eight folks, and then we were about 100, and then God started to breathe on it. But from that, those early days, we have done our best to be faithful. The first offering that was given at the Father's house was elementary, Browns Valley Elementary School. 104 people showed up that day. Most of them were friends, relatives, and people I paid to be there. <laughs> the next week, there was 65. The third week, there was 35. I did the math. I thought, this sucker's over. Fourth week, there won't be anybody, and then God started growing it. But the first week, those 140 people gave over $5,000. And the Holy Spirit whispered to me, he said, I want you to give the entirety of it to missions and to other ministries. And so that's how the church was started, by being generous and living with an open hand. And we've been doing that ever since. I just want to thank you and, and give you an update and a report. As of this year, we gave more away over the wall to other missions, ministries, churches, church plants, community outreach than any time in our 27 year history. And just our campuses, East Bay, Roseville, Napa, Slavic, uh, not including all of our church plants and the Father's House Network, just our campuses. Last year, you guys gave $3.8 million to World Missions, to Prison Church Network, to church planning. 
Why? Because God has put it in our hands to be a blessing. Now, I want to help your theology today. God has blessed you and wants to bless you so that you can be a blessing to the nations of the earth. Once you become a Christ follower and a disciple, it's bigger than your survival. Now, I know some of you are in survival mode. I get it. You're just trying to figure out how to pay the electricity bill, get through this week without sinning, not face planning in your Christian walk, and that's all good. Keep walking toward him. But as you grow in your faith and your heart becomes enlarged to the things of God, he will give you a burden and a heart for people, groups you've never seen. And you'll begin to realize that God wants to bless my life. This is a covenant promise from your heavenly father. Now, I know people are jaded and churches get a bum rap about just wanting people's money and all the nonsense and the rhetoric that's gone on for so long. But I want you to hear the word of the Lord today. That it is his promise that he wants to bless you, to be a blessing. And if you've never seen this in the scriptures, I want to read two powerful verses before I close today about how you've been called to be a channel of blessing. Look at Galatians 3.29. If you do not have this highlighted or underlined in your Bible, please do so. It's an important verse. Here's what it says. If you belong to Christ... Let me just check all locations. Anybody in the room that say, I belong to Christ. You're proud, you're loud. I have decided to follow Jesus. I belong to Christ. Well, then you are the true children of Abraham. You are his heirs. And God's promise to Abraham belongs to you. Now, some people just read over that in Galatians and go, whatever that means, Abraham, I think I know him, great guy. Yeah, I had the kid. Yeah, great. Abraham, Sarah, check. You need to slow down and go, wait, wait, time out. What is the promise given to Abraham? If that promise belongs to me when I'm in Christ, because promises have to be walked into, spoken over your life, claimed and inherited. Look what it says. Here's where the first covenant promise took place, and then it repeats throughout Genesis, then Isaac and Jacob and the 12 tribes. But here's when God met with Abraham in Genesis 12. The Lord said to Abraham, I will make you into a great nation, and I will bless you, and I'll make your name great, and you will be a blessing. Will you read that bold with me? You will be a blessing. And in you, all the families, the nations, and the people of the earth will be blessed. This is the covenant promise for those that are in Christ. God says, I will bless you and you will be a blessing. He didn't say, I'm gonna bless you so you can hold on to it. I'm gonna bless you so you can amass riches and secure your retirement. And God wants you to be secure. The wise man lays up an inheritance for his children's children. That's what we believe in. But at the same time, God says, I've, I've poured blessing and promise upon you so that you can have a heart for the nations. Now, as we sit here, some of you think, well, Dave, I've never thought of that before, and I don't see myself just being some kind of global ambassador and investing in missions around the world. Well, seek him some more. Make yourself available. Ask God what he wants to do with you and through you. You know, I was a new convert and just praying and seeking the Lord. And I remember one time I prayed for private prayer time. God dropped a nation in my heart out of nowhere. And I've been praying for that nation for 40 years. Now, I've been to probably 45 different nations in my life in missions and ministry. And we did something where we trained worship leaders in a bunch of nations. Uh, there was a decade when I was in my early 40s, early 50s, I, I averaged going and doing conferences and worship stuff uh, about four nations a year, so about 40-some nations in the, that 10 years. But I've never been to this nation, but I have an inheritance there because God dropped it in my heart. Now, here's what happens. When you begin to seek him, he's gonna bring you to a place where there's an altar in your life. And this altar is a place where God's gonna ask something from you and of you that it's gonna cost you. For some, it's a relationship. It's, there's an altar, and God says, I need you to redirect your desires in this relationship. For some, it's a business. For some, it's a, it's a stretch of faith you can't imagine taking, but God will lead you to this altar. Yeah. Let me just share one story briefly with you, and some of you may have heard this, but I've only got so many stories, and I don't want to start making them up. That never works out well. <laughs> but Don and I were just young in ministry, and traveling on the road with a music group and the group blew up and broke up. And so just Don and I were traveling and we, we were the special music at a missions conference, a little town called Lamont. And if you've never been there, don't worry about it. Um, 
go to Bakersfield, take a left. Go out in the middle of the desert. When it feels like you're about ready to drive into the Grand Canyon, boom, there's Lamont. Population, who cares? <laughs> but there was an amazing church there. And um, Revival Tabernacle. And so we were supposed to be the special music. We sang and did our thing. And, and then this guy got up, this man of God by the name of Savelle Phillips, who was actually one of the overseers of the Father's house before he went to be with Jesus. And I'm 24, 25 years old. This is circa 2000, uh, excuse me, 1984, 85. Do the math. You know how old I am. And I'm sitting there as a, a young kid in my mid-20s. And he gets up and he starts talking about the vision God put in his heart. And he wanted to translate the Bible into every tongue and language on earth for people who didn't have a Bible. Now, right now, as you sit here, there's 195 sovereign nations in the world. There's about 50 some that are countries that don't have their, their sovereign status as a nation. But at that time, there was less than half of the nations in the world had the Bible in their own language. Do you know right now, there is um, 1.5 billion people left in the earth that don't have the Bible in their dialect. So we still have some work to do. Because Jesus said that this gospel will be preached to all the nations, and then the end will come. Back then, 40 years ago, there was, there was far more nations that didn't have the word of God. And here's Savell. He's saying, God's given me a vision to translate. And this is before things were moving around digitally. I'm talking printing presses and cases of Bibles and smugglers called mules taking Bibles into countries where it was illegal to take Bibles. And he's weeping. And God reached out and grabbed my 25-year-old heart and said, you have a part to play in this. And I said, Lord, I'm all in. Whatever it takes, I'm your guy. I'm available. And the Lord whispered a number. Now, I, I share the number with you just to give you some kind of relevant uh, download of, of the altar that God called me to. At this time, our band was probably bringing in about a thousand bucks a month. We were barely surviving, and we always tied. The first and the best belongs to the Lord. So God speaks to me. I'm sitting there close to the front. Savelle's preaching. God says, I want you to give $300 a month first to this ministry. So if you check out my tithe. That's like 40% of my income. I'm like, okay, God's trying to kill me. I get it. <laughs> A living sacrifice. <laughs> and so it was an altar. And, and I don't say this to boast in my spirituality. I was a desperate man, but I was seeking God and my heart was, Lord, whatever you ask, you have my preemptive yes. You see, when you seek the Lord, you will get a yes in your spirit before you even know the question. You'll be like Isaiah in Isaiah chapter six. He was a wicked man. He gets beamed into the presence of God. And he said, woe is me. That means cursed and doomed. I am an unclean man with unclean lips and I live among a people that are wicked. And God takes a coal from the altar and touches his lips. And a few moments later in the narrative, there's a conversation going on in heaven. And they said, who will go for us? Who can we send as an ambassador? Here's Isaiah over by the altar. He said, here am I, send me. You see, when you seek God, he will purify you. He will take a coal from the altar. He'll set you apart to be holy. And when he says, I need somebody to be a mouthpiece, I need somebody to give, he's gonna have your yes before you even know the question. And so I had already given God my yes, and he said, I'm gonna need 300 bucks a month. And I said, yes, Lord. And so we did, we began to give. Now let me tell you the rest of the story. Let me tell you how God works in your life. While we're in Lamont, California, there was a guy up in a hospital bed in Roseburg, Oregon, and he'd been in an injury, an accident, he was injured, and there was two potential insurance claims that were both gonna pay off, and he made this promise, this covenant with God. He said, Lord, if both of these come through, I'll give the entirety of one to Dave Patterson and his music group, which was just dwindled down to me and Donna, <laughs> Sonny and Cher. <laughs> there we were. He, doesn't, he barely knows me. God spoke to him. So we leave Lamont. We go back to Huntington Beach. Now I'm a youth pastor. A few months go by, and a check comes in the mail. An envelope comes in the mail, and I open it up, and it was the largest check I'd seen in my life. There's more zeros. I, I don't know where they stopped. It was thousands and thousands of dollars. This guy's insurance settlement paid off, and maybe because he was in pain and highly medicated, he made a vow to give it all to me. I don't care how it happened. <laughs> I just got to the bank as quick as I could and cashed the check. <laughs> we did the math. Okay, we did the math. Track back. 
It were the same days, it would be the same days that we were in Lamont, sitting in that chair, saying yes to God, that he was laying in a hospital bed, saying, God, if this comes through, I'll send this. Don't kid yourself. God knows. He sees. He's a covenant-keeping God. He's just looking for a reason to bless your finances. He's looking for a reason to supernaturally invade your world and prove that he's a covenant-keeping God. So I want to challenge you to step up when an altar appears. And this is not a financial giving message. There'll be no offering taken at the end. I'm going to ask the band to come, and I want to ask you a personal question. What altar is before you at this time? You see, when you seek the Lord, he leads you to an altar. And when you know his heart, when you know who he is, no request is unreasonable. For the heart that's been captivated by his love, whatever he asks, we just say, Lord, you're it. Where else can we go? You deserve it all. You are worthy of it all. But in your seeking, listen, you will be led to an altar. I guarantee it. It will be an altar of investment, of sacrifice, of ministry, of relationships, a shift in the way you think. God will bring you to some, a place personally. And you know the signif significance of an altar, right? It's the place where something's got to die. Yeah. Right. Something is laid on that altar that has been put to death and will be put to death. And it's your flesh, it's your carnal desires, it's things you don't need in your life. But if you lay that thing on the altar, God says, now I will send my fire and, and hear this, on the other side of the altar is the covenant inheritance. Even for Abraham. God told Abraham after waiting all those years for a son and finally Isaac, the son of laughter was born and Isaac's growing up the joy of his life. He gets in his early teens and the Lord said, take Isaac, your son, your only son and see Mount Moriah in the distance. I want you to climb that mountain and offer him as a sacrifice. You know what Abraham did? It says he got up early the next morning and he loaded up the donkey with the wood and he got his son and they began to go, go up the hill and God said, Isaac said, Dad, I, I see the donkey, I see the knife, I see the wood, but where is the sacrifice? And what was his response? God will provide a lamb. God will provide a lamb. You see, Abraham was willing to make the ultimate sacrifice because he was a friend of God and it wasn't unreasonable. And whatever God is asking of you in this time of seeking, it's not unreasonable in light of who he is. And on the other side of your altar is the covenant promise fulfilled. It's God saying, now I will bless you and your descendants will be like the sands of the seashore and I will withhold nothing from you because you have not withheld from me. God is calling all of us during this time of seeking to an altar where we say, God, it all belongs to you anyway. Here I am. Seeking will lead you to an altar, and an altar will lead you to covenant inheritance and a future you can't imagine. And over and over again, in my life and the life of this church, there's been new altars presented. And every time, I'll just share one more. I know I'm getting kind of nostalgic, vulnerable, and oversharing stories, but this one might help you. When I planted this church, I felt like the Holy Spirit led me to make a covenant agreement with God in a place called Vacaville, of all places. I mean, I lived in Huntington Beach. I mean, there was the beach right there. You know, Vacaville was the place you stopped for a burger on the way to the airport. That's what Vacaville was to me. I felt like the Lord said, when you plant this church, I want you to commit that you will spend the rest of your ministry years here. This was in 1997. I'm like, here I am, <laughs> me and the nut tree, <laughs> wide spot on the highway. But on the other side of covenant commitment, look what the Lord has done. Look what the Lord has done. Oh. What's your altar? What's he asking of you? What's on the other side of that commitment? Let's bow our heads. Other campuses, you can go into a ministry time. Love you so much. <laughs> Holy Spirit, we thank you for where you've led us as a people. And in these final moments, I want to honor the Holy Spirit and make this personal. I want to ask you this question. What is the altar before you right now? For some of you, this might be a moment where you're saying, Jesus, I want to give you my life. I've yet to surrender all that I am to you.
And I would ask you today to make that decision. We'll close the service out with a time of worship and prayer and an opportunity to come and receive prayer, bow your heart before the Lord. And if you've yet to surrender your life to Jesus, today's your day. There's others in the room that you know what that altar is. You're a Christ follower, but God is asking you for something right now. And I wanna ask you to make a decision, a, a leap of faith, a step, take some action upon that request. And here's how we're gonna close the service out. We're gonna sing an old chorus that maybe you know, Lord, I give you my heart. And we'll have our prayer team up front as we do. And we'll pray for anybody who needs healing, needs prayer. But if God's speaking to you and today's your altar moment, I'm gonna ask you to come and perhaps bow, kneel, or find someone to pray with and say, God, I give you my yes and I lay it on the altar. So Holy Spirit, we welcome you now to work in our hearts. I ask you, Holy Spirit, to make it obvious to each person in the room what's next. What is the altar? What is the invitation? Father, and I pray for every believer in this room that is faithfully giving and tithing, that you would speak to our hearts regarding our part in a global reach. Let it be specific, let it be clear that we might make an impact for eternity here at the Father's house.